Hi guys, today we've got uh, another episode of Water Into Wine, which is based on a Michael Paul's podcast of the same name. I've put the link in the description of this live stream for this episode, and through that, through there you can see his other episodes of his podcast if you wish to uh, find out a bit more information about it. So this episode delves into uh, Leonardo's artwork and... Um, also, the planets and symbolism on the planets and stuff like that. It's quite an interesting. So I think I'll hand it to Michael because I'm sure he's going to have a lot of information to share about this. And uh, we'll go from there. That's Thank okay. you, John. Um, well, first of all, it's nice to be here again. Thank you very much for inviting me back. Um, what, when I was going around Europe on these little, these little weekend breaks, the city breaks... Um, as I said, I went to Florence to to in, into the Uffizi and and saw the birth of birth of Venus by Botticelli, and I went to Paris and Rome as well to look into into separate. I went all around the Vatican in Rome. It's an amazing place, very 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 wealthy place. I must admit. So so um, I started noticing within, um, especially in the Louvre, within certain works of art, there was there was a pagan a pagan theme that kept coming out at me and, and it's and you know paganism has got a bad rap over the years because certain organizations have been trying to push us away from paganism we're all pagan we're all animals we all live on earth and that's it that's where it stopped and paganism is just the love of mother earth and everything that she gives us and when you go right the way back in time the further back you go the more more defined it is um the Egyptians, every single one of their gods was in charge of a different piece of reality. So you had God of the sun, God of the moon, God of the night, God of the day, God of the clouds, God of the grass, God of this, God of that, God of the water. Da, 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 da. But every single one of them was part of nature. It Basically, they didn't call it this. This is a modern invention, but it was paganism um, from a very, very grassroots level. And we've just put the name pagan over the over the top of it. I mean, pagan means comes from the Latin paganus, and it means country dweller. So, because they understood nature more than anybody else. So, when you go back to Leonardo's Da Vinci time, fifteen hundred, fourteen fifties, fourteen hundreds, people were 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 burned at the stake for for following paganism. So. It was really mystifying to me to see these these and Botticelli was the same to see these artists, very, very good artists for their time, being pagan in their images, although they probably weren't outside their images. It, you know, people were burnt at the stake for less than that. So I noticed there was a particular painting that Leonardo da Vinci painted twice. One of them is called Madonna of the Rocks. Um, and the other one is called, oh, look at that. I had it a minute ago. The name slipped me. Virgin of the Rocks. That was it. Madonna of the Rocks and Virgin of the Rocks. Now, one of these is in a museum in London, and the other one is in the Louvre in Paris. And they are virtually exactly the same. But he painted the first one, and the angel of the Lord, who's in the picture with her arm round John the Baptist, this is... This is uh, Leonardo da Vinci's explanation of him, was pointing her hand at Jesus, uh, who's next to his mother, Mary, and she had her arm around Jesus. So, And they refused to pay for the painting, and it went on for a few years, and on and on and on and on. They said it had anti-Christian symbolism encoded in it. And this is in the, I think this was mentioned in the da Vinci Code as well. Well, when you get deeper into it, he painted another version, which is why there's two versions. And the difference was the angel of the Lord, you, was it Uriel? I can't remember. I did know the name of the angel. She doesn't have her hand pointing at one of the children. It's now pointing down. And the, the uh, um, organization that hired him, the church that hired him, changed the meaning. They said, instead of Jesus with uh, Mary's arm around him and John the Baptist baptizing Jesus, they swapped the children. 
they said Mary had her arm round John the Baptist and the angel of the Lord had her arm round Jesus. Well, that mystified the living daylights out of me. Why would you? It, it seems like such a finicky thing to do. So I started delving deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. And I found out the reason uh, that that and I think this came out in the in the Da Vinci Code as well. The reason the two children were swapped is because you can see the genitals of the child next to Mary and you can't see the genitals of the car, the, the child next to the angel of the Lord. So basically, if Jesus is next to Mary, you can see his genitals and that means he's a normal man. He's not divine. So that was reason. I, I, I stumbled across that was the reason. But you, whenever you look at a picture of Jesus, he's always got a wisp of cloth around his genital area. There's an, there's one of him on the, on the cross, and there's still this cloth covering his genitals. So it made it made very much sense. I started looking more into Leonardo's work, and I come across the Vitruvian Man. Now he followed the the footsteps of a, I think it was 30 BC, Vitruvian, the architect. And the architect said, um, if the body, the human body is divinely created, then any building that's created with the same proportions will also be a divine building. So now that interested me, because I found out that Leonardo took I think it was about three and a half years, maybe a little bit longer, out of all of his painting to dissect bodies for this one drawing. It was never a painting, and the and the drawing's still about. It's in I think that's in Rome somewhere. Um I could be wrong with that. It might be it might even be in the Louvre. I don't know. So the gist of it is he and this the paint when you look at it, get it up on your screens, and it's it's anatomically perfect. I mean it's amazing that somebody can draw this perfect. And it's the man in the centre with his arms and legs outstretched and he's in a square and in a circle. So now I want to know what is so important about this drawing that he spent two and a half, three years getting it perfect and what does the square on the circle represent? It was just a nagging feeling in the back of my head that there's more in that. So Leonardo explained the, the drawing as man bridges the gap between the um, terrestrial world, which is what the square represents, because it's got four corners, earth, air, fire and water, and the celestial world, which is heaven or spirit world because it's a circle and it never ends there's no starting or ending it's always been there always will be there and it just keeps going round and round and round now th th this man was no fool he was no fool at all very very intelligent man all of a sudden why is he turning around and saying that we bridge the gap between the two worlds when I later on, when I uh, got asked to become a Freemason, I found out that the Freemasons are heavily into squares and circles. Um, as well as the colours, black and white. And then I started stumbling across a, a phrase, as above, so below, which is supposed to be on the emerald carved, on the emerald tablets of Toth. And this this is really mystifying now. With I mean, we're stumbling at this point, we're stumbling across the early, the early beginnings, or, or for me anyway, the early findings of sacred geometry. And I didn't realize it at the time how big that was in our lives, but it's huge. So Leonardo saying that we bridge the gap between the earthbound body and the celestial celestial um, um, world to where we bridge the gap between the two worlds. And the more I was to find out along this 17 year journey, the more that rings true. And it wasn't until after about 10 years or so, I looked back and I went, oh, my word, he was telling us. He's actually telling us the answer. So this sacred geometry I started getting involved with at that, at that point, I found out that Venus over the, I've got this written down here because I wanted to get it right. Venus over the years, eight years, it, it um, 
is in perfect alignment with the Earth and the Sun five times. And when you draw a line between these five times, it becomes a pentacle or pentagram, I think it's called, without the circle around it. Now, whenever you see a pentagram, it's normally got a circle around it. Now, that circle represents the orbit of the Earth around the Sun. So it, it, that goes back, oh, it goes back thousands and thousands and thousands of years. And I have no idea how uh, the ancient civilizations, other than dimethyltryptamine use, I had no idea how they found out or how they knew this very basic building block of nature. This is how reality is built with these signs. Mercury is the same. Mercury revolves around the sun and, uh, and is in alignment three times in 50 weeks. So it's in alignment, and this, this gets a little bit more complicated. It's in alignment three times positive, which means it's directly next to the Earth in the middle of that and the sun, and three times negative which means it's round the opposite side of the sun, but it's still in alignment. All the three are in alignment. And when you draw a line between these alignments, it becomes the Star of David or the Seal of Solomon uh, because it's got six points. Again, that goes back thousands and thousands and thousands of years. Even King Solomon was, was playing, who there's no archaeological evidence he ever existed, by the way. Uh, because we're looking for the wrong name. That's that's the reason I think why. Um, yeah, he he was supposed to have carved this on on the walls of Jerusalem as a good luck symbol. And again, when you put that in a circle um, to mount it, it becomes a, a, a hexagram. I think that, that it was called something like that. But that's the orbit of the Earth around the Sun. Um. Over this over this amount of time, this amount of years, I started coming across Latin phrases. The, these these shapes, for example, they go through everything in, in what we call reality. For example, if you cut an apple width-wise and then look at the core, it's a pentacle. It's that's the shape of it. And nobody's put it there. That's nature producing that shape. There's a um, there's a certain place in, I think it's Ireland, called the Devil's Causeway or something like that. And they've got rocks coming up out of the floor that are a hexagonal shape. Nobody's put them there. Nobody's carved it. This is nature producing this, presumably, with a sound frequency, as I, as I later found out. Um, if you cut open a beehive and look at the shape inside the beehive the 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 shape where the bees actually get into it's a hexagonal shape it's a seal of solomon so if you cut open or open a wasp, wasp's nest these these beehives and wasp's nests are, are an absolute work of art I, I had one in a flat that i used to own and um i cut it in half in the winter because i needed to get rid of it i couldn't believe the first time i'm going back 20 years now the first time that I'd ever seen inside one of these. It was absolutely phenomenal. I couldn't believe the the precision with which this was built. And it was a wasp. You know, we just write wasps off because they're well, they're annoying, basically. Mm -hmm. um, but it, again, where the wasp goes, it's a hexagonal shape. It's a six pointed star shape. Um, what else was I going to tell you about here? Snowflakes as well. Um, if you there's a, there's a phrase going around that says that every snowflake is 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 a perfect individual shape. It's it's not a uniform shape, and where that's true, but when you look at the individual geometric pattern that makes the snowflake, where each snowflake is a is a number of these patterns put together, and that is that's not uniform. That's all wiggledy piggledy. But when you look at the basic geometric pattern, again, it's the Star of David, uh, or the Seal of Solomon, or a hexagonal shape, whatever you want to, whatever you want to call it. Um, and doing all this over the years, I started bumping into Latin phrases. So I decided to look a little bit into certain phrases 
that we'd been we've been told by uh, churches and so on and so forth that were evil or or nasty and we should stay away from them and i found out that the word satan was a, a demonization of the planet saturn now that's made me even more curious about saturn so i started looking at saturn i looked at the north pole of saturn with pictures from i think the pictures were from nasa and you can see a cloud formation on the north pole of saturn that's a hexagonal shape again Sela solomon it's the star of david when you draw a line between all the points it becomes a star of david now that mystified me very very much because if all these patterns are put together through sound sound doesn't travel through space because there's no atmosphere there's no air and where there's no atmosphere there's no sound so how is this on the and i still haven't come to the bottom of this how is this on the north pole of saturn and when you look at the south pole of saturn it's quite clearly it looks like an eye um and it's just rocks and dust it's made up the same stuff it's just moving around in a circular pattern um producing this as the center uh, as the center shape so with all the 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 i finding out that that satan was a demonization of the word saturn i decided to look at the word lucifer um because we all know lucifer is the devil he's the horned beast he lives in a place which is all fire and brimstone and nasty and screaming and horrible um but and it wasn't originally like that the horned people were were represented as gods because every god you go back far enough every god had horns this was the reason that the vikings put the horns on their hats because when they were stout standing on the bow of their ship going in into battle they all put the hats on and they wanted the people they were about to attack to panic because you know the gods are coming to get us so that made a lot of sense to me um obviously obviously that that all these gods had super super powers they were undefeatable and the word lucifer comes from latin the the word in latin is lasum lasum fair lasum fair lasum fair so you can see how it's become lucifer but lasum fair means morning star it's got no devil devil attached to it at all when you go back to the the use of latin and lasum fair they were referring to the planet venus because venus being one of the brightest stars in the sky it was the last planet to be seen in the morning the first planet to be seen at night so it used to it used to pierce through the 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 semi daylight and because it it bookended the day start and stop the ancients used to believe that this was a sacred feminine thing so the planet venus took on a mother figure if you like it took on a an all controlling um pagan pagan attribute and incidentally when i looked at um um botticelli's birth of venus in the uffizi he represents it's called the birth of venus obviously venus was standing there as a mother nature type figure she's got the wind blowing in her hair and she's standing on a seashell and it's a particular type of seashell now i've seen this seashell all over christian churches the 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 shell itself and if you get have a look at the birth of venus by botticelli you'll see this and you'll know exactly it's a it's a perfect seashell um it represents the mother half of nature and reproduction so rejuvenating that's that's the gist that's the gist of that um it's it's lovely it's a lovely lovely painting it's right by the door as well which i couldn't believe when i when I went in there i thought to myself what's stopping people from nipping in sticking it under their coat and get it out again but i wouldn't like to test it <laughs> so, yeah so the, this sacred geometry um excursion i took on this whole this whole um journey that i've been on 
was very, very, very revealing to me. Um, reality, what we call reality, is made up of, and this, this gets into involved with the simulation theory that, that quantum physicists and scientists in general, most of them anyway, are all saying that reality is a simulation. It's a computer simulation. This is the reason, one of the reasons, uh, as well as heavy mathematics, that they're saying this is because all of reality is made up of these very, very basic, and I mean very basic shapes, put together like the like the Seal of Solomon in a snowflake and put together loads of times to make what we call reality, stones and grass and sky and trees and all the rest of it. Um, but you know, that particular part, it was really mystifying me. So so who's putting this together? Why is it going together? And And later on, when I started stumbling across cymatics on YouTube, where you can actually see the building blocks of life being put together. Uh, scientists have been using sand or salt to do this. And some of them have got a speaker and they put a, um, like a metal grill over the top of the speaker. It's not a grill, it's a flat piece of metal over the top of the, the speaker and suspend it just above the speaker. Then they pour sand and you'll go onto YouTube. You'll see this thousands of times. It's fascinating to watch this sand all over the, uh, all over the metal plate. And then they play particular frequencies through the speaker. And you can see the sand jump into an, a, a prearranged pattern for that sound. And it's the absolutely most fascinating thing I've ever sat and watched. Uh, there's people doing it in their houses. It's all over YouTube. Um, and also scientists are, are, have started to, when I first started this quest, you couldn't, I couldn't stumble across any of this. There's rumours that the Great Pyramid of Giza was put together by levitating the stones. And this come from, um, sadly not with us anymore, Hakim, I think his name was, his second name, who was an elder. He was an Egyptian elder. And there was a programme on TV with Joanna Lumley where she was having, having a tour Sorry. around Egypt. And she was in a boat with Hakim. No. And... Hakim is actually saying Hello. to her that, yes, they levitated the, the stones Hello. into position. That's why they could do it so quickly. And then Joanna Lumley looks at the camera and she went, as if oh, he's a lunatic. But there's legends and rumours of not just the Egyptians doing this, but monks as well uh, around Southern America Hello. and Mayans. They, they were doing yes, this. And, is, yeah. and that really mystified me. And then all of a sudden I started right, coming across okay. sonic levitation videos, which you can still see on um, on on eBay to, on, on eBay on YouTube today. Um, just go and have a look. This oh, is yes, the yes. most fascinating right, yeah. thing I've ever seen. That there's these scientists in a sealed box. They put two speakers, one either side. Um, let's get the centre. That's it. One either side like that, and then in the centre they put a tiny little droplet of water and you can see them they're playing the speaker playing two different tones right, through okay. the speaker i don't know yeah. what tones there are yeah, he, and okay, i would love to replicate okay, this, okay, but i don't know what i don't think i'll be able to do it to be honest i haven't got the apparatus why you suddenly being like they're this? moving the yeah, droplets yeah. of water up and down and then the next in the next um, uh, no, video no, i saw no. they were using no. small pieces of polystyrene and these pieces of polystyrene, by changing the frequencies slightly that's hitting the polystyrene from, from the speakers, it, they were twisting and they were going upside down. They were able to turn and manoeuvre invisibly. Right, OK. Now, I'll, um... in amongst all okay, I'll this, later, I started she stumbling across Solomon. If you refuse um, as it, I, I said before, there's no uh, archaeological evidence that make he him ever go. existed. You know, I, don't I don't think do. that's his name. Um, um, I, I can't no. find out what the name means. Um, like Moses, no, he's, for he's example. Not brilliant at home either. He's uh, a sacred leader and so on and so forth. And I can't find the, the, the name for Solomon. So I, I can't at home. say to he's you definitely been. his name's been changed. But yeah, it's very first of all, in the Egyptian Museum in Cairo, there's a body that they found 
that has been killed okay. using the same wounds as yeah. okay, the yeah, Freemasons yeah. call um, Hiram Abiff. See what she says. And uh, as we've told, okay. we've been Thank told that Solomon was killed. Bye. Bye. And that is a um, front of the head caved in, side of the head caved in, and the back of the head cracked open. And uh, the, the body's called, the mummy's called, if I can get it right, Sekenre Teo the Second. Have a look at that, that, that body, that mummy. And nobody really knows a lot about this pharaoh. Um, but he was a pharaoh. And uh, they know that much, but they don't know any more about it. Um, so, Solomon, he, he said, just jumping back slightly there, he, he, it said that he was given a ring by God, and on the ring was the seal of Solomon, which is why it's called the seal of Solomon, and there's certain shapes. You can, you can research this, and you can see different um, esoteric signs on the seal of Solomon. And, and the explanation goes, he was given this brass ring by God. And with this ring, he used to control the forces of the invisible demons. Um, and I've just forgotten one of the demons' names. It's in Renle Chateau, the church in Renle Chateau. They put, a, they put a demon in there. I can't remember the name there. Um, no, I can't remember the name now. It's it's quite a famous demon. Uh, but he used to control the demon and the invisible forces to build the pyramids. And No, sorry, to build Solomon's temple. Because there's huge stones, and nobody knows how these stones have been listed, lifted. And it's the same as the, as the Great Pyramid. Nobody knows how these stones were lifted. They go from two and a half ton to 80 to 100 tons. We, and it's nearly 500 feet tall. We haven't got a crane. There has never been a crane in history built that can carry 80 tons up to 500 feet. It doesn't exist ever. It's never existed. Um, and the, the tallest one I could find was, I think it was called a crawl or something like that, the crane was called. And it was um, something like 316 feet tall. The legend that he took this ring to control the invisible forces to to build the temple, it fitted with me that he was using sound to levitate these stones. At that part, I stumbled across an, another guy, this has just hit me in the brain, called, oh, for the life of me, I can't remember his name there. I do discuss this in a later episode of the of the, um, um, of the podcast, but he built. It's called Coral Castle, and I think it's in Florida or something like that. He built a complete castle out of coral, and he said when somebody asked him, "How did you build this?" Because some of these stones were huge some of these lumps of coral weighed tons and he's also got a door that he put in with no hinges it balances perfectly on on one side of it and you can open and close it and it weighs tons you can open and close it with your finger just pushing it gently it opens and closes and he said i found out how they made the pyramid and i built coral castle to um Leader, hang on, he's Leader Skin, I think his name is something like that. Leader Skin, um, and yeah, he said, I found out how they built the, the pyramids, and I used the same. Um, he didn't say what it was, mind you. I didn't, and he took that to his grave now because he's not with us anymore. You can still go around and see Coral Castle, they've opened it up, and you can you just pay your whatever and you just walk around and have a look at it. It's an amazing place. Um, yeah, I found out how they built the pyramids, so I built Coral Castle using the same principles. So I think this levitating with the use of sound thing isn't as far-fetched as, as Joanna Lumley originally thought it was when Hakim said it. I think this holds some weight, and I think only time's going to tell, John, that, that scientists will come out with a way to levitate um, heavier objects. As I say, it's only, um, um, it's only plastic cups and 
bits and pieces and water and tiny little droplets and beads. I think they've done beads as well. There's a guy in, in America that's like a, and he really is like a nutty professor. He levitates using magnetism, levitates um, iron iron balls, great big iron bearings, as big as bowling balls. And he can levitate these and move them around the room. Uh, and he's using sound and magnetism to do that. And, and and he's quite a fascinating fellow as well, I, I, but I don't know. I didn't actually put him in the book, and he's he's. I think he's only just met just the way I've just mentioned that in in the podcast. He was just mentioned then. So that that was that was the um, episode two, really. To be honest with you, it was my discovery of of sacred geometry more than anything else, and how it builds up what we call reality. Oh, as fascinating and. As you know, I, I listen to each episode before we do each show to try and take notes. And all the questions I had, you've answered already. So that was like, oh, that's good. I was going to ask, oh, the technology that was around in Leonardo da Vinci's time, did they have telescopes for that? They didn't have them then, did they? Or... Um, a, a Galileo was the inventor of the telescope, wasn't right. he? He was okay. imprisoned by saying that the Earth revolved around the sun. This is... <laughs> But he was on house arrest for donkey's years over that. All right. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think that was more that was more fourteen hundreds. Yeah, that was more fourteen hundreds, something like that. I mean, you know, I, I I don't know the date for definite, but there's something in the back of my head saying it was around that time. So Leonardo could well have understood the telescope. Yeah, because I just can't get over the fact that they know the planets and stuff and without any sort of technology to, to know it, you know what I mean? And then, as you said, if they used um, drugs to, you know, hucigenics or something to uh, see it that way, I don't know how they could do it, you know? It's, it's amazing how they they learned about the planets. Well, I've, I've, I've interviewed quite a few people that have taken dimethyltryptamine. Uh, the first thing they always say is that this is the most mind-expanding um on the consciousness expanding thing that they've ever done in their life yeah it's a very dangerous drug because if you've got anything that's not quite right with you um it makes you stare it full in the face so mm. uh people I, i've got an acquaintance that took lsd which has got dimethyltryptamine in it it's the active ingredient and he's had depression ever since now that was donkey's years ago yeah. and, and you can't get away from depression so it's not something that you should be uh, messing about with no no i agree um but yeah they they all say everyone that i've spoken to about dmt directly they all say that it explains the way reality is yeah and i'm yet to find somebody that comes back from a trip that doesn't think what we call reality is false it doesn't exist yeah you need to speak to a friend of mine he's known as mr robot he's an ominous and he's because he's done a lot of experiments with that, because he's a scientist by by trade anyway. And uh, the stories he has from it, oof. He, oh, he, no, yeah. He's amazing. You really got to, you, we've got to get you two together. We have to. Yeah, definitely. But they meet, they meet during this trip, they meet alien greys. Yeah. Um, and and when, I, when I discovered DMT, I started looking at certain biblical passages, and they made so much sense. I'm going to tell you a passage now. Um, it's the story of Moses, who was leading uh, the the Israelites out of Egypt. And he needed inspiration. So he went off up into the mountain. And uh, I'm obviously paraphrasing. I didn't put it like this in, <laughs> in biblical text. But he went off into the mountain. So, And he's found a burning bush. And then he heard the voice of God. So he then got the inspiration from that and come down from the mountain and explain to the Israelites what was going on, what where they're going to go, what they're going to do. Then you find out when you, when you dig deep enough that these bushes and trees that are around that time, they're all related to the acacia bush or the acacia tree. The acacia wood, called shittim wood, is also what the Ark of the Covenant, two and a half inches thick of that, what the Ark of the Covenant was made of. So when you set fire to this particular branch of the bush, the, the bark burns, 
but the the inner wood doesn't burn because it's full of sap so it it, it won't burn but it so it stays intact but the bush itself burns which is exactly what they say happened um, when Moses found the burning bush. The bush was intact, but it was still alight. So you look at the chemical makeup of the, the bark that's on this bush or tree, and you find it, there's zero, I can't remember whether it is 6% or 0.6% dimethyltryptamine. So I think Moses... Moses, were, the word means sacred leader, and the pharaohs were sacred leaders of their time because of the ritual of the twice-born that they went through, which we discussed last week. Yeah. I think Moses was going up into the mountain to look for a particular bush that he knew contained something that would make him see and, and be able to talk to the, the other realm. So he found the bush, he set fire to it, and then he just went bosh straight out after breathing in the, the smoke. Because uh, everybody that um, I've spoken to, smoking it is the quickest way to get it into the bloodstream, this dimethyltryptamine. Mm -hmm. So it makes a lot of sense that he, that he used fire to do it. Um, yeah, bosh, he's out. He's met or was in the presence of the sacred feminine, which fits with everyday modern people when they turn around and say they took it they always have this all all protecting all loving all controlling um which are feminine feminine products you look at any household the woman runs the household that's the bottom line of it all um and even dr phil on tv says don't fellas don't mess with the nest she's in control and that's that so and I think that they, they all they all come back and say no, it was a feminine entity, but they never saw it. Um, they could only understand it, and they could only feel its presence. And I think Moses done the same thing. It's just my thought. I've got no cast iron evidence on this, but the what he says he done, and what DMT gives you are exactly the same thing. So he would come down with a lot more inspiration than he went up with. Mm. That does make sense. Yeah. That does make sense, actually. Uh, you said on the um, podcast the about Venus being Earth's twin and stuff. You, I think you said on about it. Um, it's got the at the surface of Venus is more like what people the Bible depicts hell to be like as well, or something like yep. that. It is now, yeah, yeah. You Do go you back like... far. You go back far enough, though. There's a fantastic little video that I watched on YouTube. Um, and it's called Earth's Evil Twin. And I just stumbled across it. It was on TV when I stumbled across it. It's about the, the course of Venus over the years, how it's changed. Venus used to be lush and green, and it was beautiful. And then they had an ecological disaster, acid rain and volcanoes and so on and so forth. Mm. And then it just went on from there, and it, it's just volcanoes were going off left, right, and center. And now it's a, a molten mess, to be honest with you. So it's exactly what we've been led to believe um, that, that, that hell's like. And I, I think that was done on purpose to keep us away from looking at Venus. Yeah, so you think there should have been life on her then? Must have been, must have been life on her at some point. I, I would have thought so. Yeah. If it was the same as Earth, that I, put, I would have put money on it. So maybe we're descendants from Venus. Maybe who knows? Yeah, I don't know. There's an interesting book: uh, women, are, women, it women for Venus and men are from Mars. Oh yeah, I've heard of that. Yeah. That keeps echoing in the back of my head. It's how we're, we're two different races that have been combined on this planet, basically. Mm, that's an interesting thought, isn't it? Uh, anyway, the prodigal sons of he, he's, he's appeared. Haha. -ha. <laughs> hey Roger, you okay? Yeah, I'm okay. I ended up just waking up. Yeah, I know it's hard for you at five in the morning, no fairness to you. I, you know what I mean? It is really hard for you. Yeah. I uh, was up all night doing edits and stuff, and I looked at the clock and I was like, oh, man, it was eight o'clock here. I was like, man, if I want to be up at five o'clock, I'd better uh, go to sleep. Next thing you know, man, nine o'clock's there, and I'm like, okay, it's time to go lay down. <laughs> so... I ended up just now getting on, so I apologize. No, no need to apologize. I'm, I'm going to listen. 
Yeah. Okay. What's uh? I was gonna say. Yeah. That, anyway, this episode's been about um the artwork of Leonardo uh, to do with the symbolism, to do with his his paintings and also. Uh, I mean, notes of it, sacred geometry, stuff like that. So, and uh, Bob Dub is liking my posts on Facebook now, so I get notifications, ding dong, <laughs> so you can hear it. Uh, yeah, so that's what this has been about so far. When, when you when I when I looked at this artwork, the, the 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 thing that struck me more than anything else is that there is no code as such. People keep going on about codes, and now it's been put in there for generations later on to find out there is no code there is no code this is natural everyday beliefs from these artists um and they took a big as i said they took a big chance in in putting these symbols in there because it's their belief but it was an undercover belief because they would have been burnt at the stake and i'm surprised they weren't to be honest with you i, I don't i have no idea why uh, Leonardo da Vinci wasn't burnt at the stake for what he done. Yeah. He, when he done the the Last Supper as well, I looked into the Last Supper, um, and after finding out about the uh, planets and everything else, I looked at the Last Supper, and it's almost like I could see it with the, in a different light. Um, he painted them in sets of three. There originally there were thirteen apostles, but he painted the the apostles, the twelve that were there, in sets of three. Now I wanted to know why would you do that? He was a he was a very 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 good painter. He was an amazing sketch uh, sketch artist. And why would he do them in sets of three? And the only answer I could get back was because he used to do them in three, so he could do three, let them dry, and then do the next three. But that doesn't ring true with me at all because it, it would have obviously been sketched out beforehand, yeah. and he could have carried on doing them singularly one there then one at the other end and then by the time he's done that that first one's dry he's done the next one that he could have done it like that but he didn't he done them in sets of three so i thought as the rest of his artwork was very pagan that there would be pagan thoughts gone behind painting them in sets of three and i started it just hit me one day uh, that there are four seasons. So there's three sets of four with him in the center. So if he's pagan, and then it started to become clearer, he represents the sun. Um, and everything else are the star alignments and the zodiac signs and the months of the year and the seasons all floating around this central point because if you if you look at him um in in the painting this is you can still go and see this painting by the way it's in a dinner dinner hall in milan he's got one hand upwards and the other hand down let's get it on screen now he's sitting there like that and that's you know that's not the comfiest of positions to sit in um and I, 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 all that all I could see was as above, so below, because I'd stumbled across it before. So I think within this painting, he was giving us again more of his belief system. He was saying in this painting, as far as I was concerned, Jesus represents the sun with all the planets and all the seasons and all the zodiac signs all floating around him, circling him. And that was that was my my thoughts on it. And I think there are a, a few other researchers that have, have come across that, obviously before me. Um, this was never a a quest to say I found the truth. Um, all I found was the other researchers that have researched this for a lot longer than I did. This this whole thing was just a a quest to see whether it was that it was to give me the knowledge that I was that I was thirsty for at the time because I've still got quite a quite a thirst for all this knowledge it's just that I, I keep coming across the same stuff over and over again now so the amount I'm learning now is diminished immensely mm -hmm. um but yeah it, it was it was to, to to do with my mental state at the time and prove that I'm not going mad and seeing all this 
go on around me, all the all the synchronistic events. So that's where I started delving, and and the two of them met. So I don't think I'm mad anymore. <laughs> no, no. Some no. people disagree. <laughs> um, Leonardo da Vinci used to fascinate me because uh, he he did some sketches and adventures, didn't he? A helicopter. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. Oh, I can remember, and I'm going back years. Scissors. On this. Scissors, like submarine, that. loads of stuff. Yeah. And he's thinking, well, how, you know, how do you you think of something like this from? You haven't even got uh, you haven't even got any flying machines around you, and yet you're thinking oh. of this intricate device. Yeah, it just thinks like where does he was he? Um, I I don't know. Um, it's just it just trying to get my mind around it. How we, how he, he came up with something yeah. like like that? You know, I I think the inspiration has come right. again from DMT. Yeah, I was thinking that. Yeah, and the same with Nikola Tesla, no, another genius. 